But anyway, okay, so what do you have for me today? Okay, well, since you mentioned the asshole, that was very creative to me, and it really uh, struck a chord with me, and I was going to ask you what you meant by that, but since you already kind of answered it. <laughs> <laughs> but I can actually, um, um, I, I do want to say that I did come up with that um, through um, the, the initials, though. I mean, as an acronym. Right. So ASP actually stood for um, Autism Traits and, mm -hmm. other, uh, and other sensory and social as well so, social and sensory processing mm -hmm. challenges so right. that's where ask came from and, right. when, and when you're dealing with like i said some people most people um with autism like traits like mm -hmm. those ones you know areas of hyper focus where they don't really care about what you care about they don't care about what they, well, it seems like they don't care about what they care about and you right. know and so you know that, that that super tunnel vision and the kind of I don't care attitude and sometimes like the flat affect and the and it really looks like they don't care because their affect is right. so flat you know, right. and all that. So sometimes it can feel like you're dealing with a challenging person. Right. <laughs> so so that's where I came up with the ask holes from. And mm -hmm. then I also did the play at words. And I know you probably caught it in the book. Um, and to the, that whole um, avoiding avoiding potential potholes, the APPs, mm -hmm. you know, avoiding potential potholes. And this is, you know, kind of gaining a better understanding of the hypersensitive individual so that mm -hmm. when you run into that, you know, you can kind of instead of, you know, just, just going full speed over that pothole, we're going to learn how to maneuver around it, right. you know, and things like right. that. And teaching people how not to, you know, get into those interactions that continually do damage, continuously do damage. To the relationship but i know you could probably pull some of that out of the book but it was really me doing a big time play at words for me it mm -hmm. felt like like one of my you know download concepts where it was like okay like this okay this fits you know mm -hmm. and so that's why i actually kept it the word in the book not the title but i kept mm -hmm. the word in the book um so that because those who get to the book they'll really be able to kind of you know, flow with it. It is not you know, right. a part of the title. Right. And so um, I wanted to first, since you started with talking about your book, I'll go with the questions that I got from reading the book and some things that kind of interest me about, like how you worked with the blue tunnel boy. Oh. So him being nonverbal and you saying that you have to find something that interests them how were you able to figure out for other parents who have nonverbal kids, how are you able to kind of pick up on something that may interest them in order for you to get their attention to actually work with them and, and be able to give them the tools that they necessary to, for him to come out of his shell, sort of to speak? Okay, so that's an excellent question. Um, so I'm gonna give a little background before I you know, give a general answer. So mm -hmm. for if she if she's re Tinky's referring to Blue Tunnel Tunnel Boy, who I referred to in my first book, The LaFayette Way: um, A Fresh Approach, approach to uh, Parenting Hypersensitive Children. And when I tell the story of Blue Tunnel Boy, um, I share that he had zero desire to engage. He was mm -hmm. um, he was on the considered on the low end of uh, autism of the autism spectrum. Um, he was considered he was not by the way but he was considered um lower intelligence even though he was a freaking genius but okay that's you know <laughs> and so we were able to kind of bring some of that genius out as well because mm -hmm. oftentimes the kids um a lot of the kids on the spectrum are are at genius level intellect okay they may choose not to engage in the way this world functions because they're not right. enormous and mm -hmm. for various other reasons um and because there's been an, um, a, a disruption in their ability to connect from the beginning of life which i also you know explained a little bit of that and i'll maybe t maybe get speak to that a little bit when i because uh, i did talk about my daughter in the book as well who had a multitude of sensory issues when she was born including an, an extreme aversion to eye contact and mm -hmm. people talking to her Mm -hmm. Okay, so which would make it bonding very difficult. But now moving mm -hmm. back into Blue Tunnel Boy, 
comes. He was completely nonverbal. He didn't answer to anything. He didn't answer to his mother calling him. He did not answer to, he did not respond. He was in his own little world. And in his particular case, he would hide from me in our sessions inside of this little blue tunnel. And, and I was just, and I was at a loss. I was reading all the books I could on autism spectrum disorder. This was the very first case I ever, I ever got um, for autism spectrum disorder. So I was trying to read every book I could because I like to try to do the best work I can. The mm -hmm. very first thing I noticed is none of those books gave me tangible. So they gave me some information, but they mm -hmm. didn't tell me what to do or how I could do it for older children. They, they have some things that maybe you can do for babies. And mm -hmm. really, quite honestly, even some of that was lacking once I learned some of the stuff that, you know, once I really dug into learning some of the stuff that I learned and, and plus just instinctually, naturally for me, those things right. didn't work because I recognized that when my daughter was a baby, that none of that, none of the stuff they mentioned would have worked for her. It had right. to go, it had to happen just the way I did it with her to desensitize her, to be very considerate of her sensitivities and to help to bring her into a space where she could bond in a way that wouldn't cause her extreme anxiety and actually mm -hmm. if we cause them extreme anxiety all they'll do is shut down anyway and mm -hmm. then you end up with the kids who are completely removed and isolated from everybody else which you know right. but anyway so with blue tunnel boy he would take this like i think it was like a two foot three foot you know tunnel and he would like take it it was supposed to be you know something that we used to interact he would take it and put it over his head and, and whenever I would try to talk to him, probably try to talk to him, he'd be like, no. And it, you know, he wouldn't say that. He would just like, tunnel over his head. And he would right. just stand there, like, straight up straight up and down flat with the tunnel on. And I'm, like, sitting there, and I'm like, I'm like, okay, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, this kid doesn't want to talk. I'm, like, in there talking to myself. Like, this kid doesn't want to talk to me. And I don't, you know, and I don't really blame him. He doesn't know me, you know, right? <laughs> he doesn't want to talk to his mama. Why does he want to talk to me? Right? right. And so then it was, like, almost, like, in all of my crazy one day i was like you know what baby i really don't blame you for not wanting to be here i don't know what to do with you and so i was like you know what one day he, he like put the tunnel over his head again i stopped talking you know he won again stop talking and he as soon as i stopped talking threw the tunnel off onto the floor and so and i looked at the tunnel i was like you know what let me try to figure out what it is that's so you know <laughs> So great about being in the tunnel, you know, because right. I was probably halfway at that mark of losing my mind. So let me see what it's like in the tunnel. So I put the tunnel over my own head and I looked around. And I was like, oh, okay, I can see why you like it in here. I was like, is you know, it 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 kind of uh, it drowns out the sounds. It, hey, all you can see is blue, you know. <laughs> you right, can't right. see me. I can't see you. Right. right. So it's crazy. Right. So and then, and then, you know, kind of came to my senses a little bit. And I was like, wait a minute, LaFay, you can't have a tunnel over your head with a whole kid in a room. So I pulled the tunnel down <laughs> to see what he's doing. I knew he wasn't going to be doing much because, you know, he just always playing with something on his own. Right. So I pulled the tunnel down. For the very first time, this kid was looking directly at me. He was looking mm -hmm. at me in my eyes with this like still flat affect, but he was looking at me and I could swear I could almost see a touch of, what are you doing lady in his eyes, right? You know, I probably made that up, but I felt like I could see a touch of what he's doing right. in his eyes. And so <laughs> then when I recognized that he was actually looking at me and made eye contact with me, I was like, oh. Then I was like, oh, oh heck no. If I don't get to look at you, you don't get to look at me and I pulled the tunnel right back up. <laughs> <laughs> and then I pulled it back up and then this time when I pulled it down he was looking at me but he was humored so he was looking at me with like this smile in his eyes he had very very flat eye affect with this smile in his eyes and then we started playing like this weird game of of like a peekaboo right mm -hmm. he's like seven weird game of peekaboo and he actually started to kind of kind of it, it started to widen out the 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 smile, the almost smile in his face. Mm -hmm. Now this developed into a lot of different things. So that I'm loud, if you can't tell, guys, I'm loud. But I'm loud. I laugh loud. I smile big. I don't care. And so, uh, but this, he actually started to mimic my facial expressions, and he started to mimic my laugh. My mm -hmm. laugh, I found out is is probably is probably terrible if I were to be self conscious about it. Like, you know, <laughs> if he started doing this thing. 
that I didn't think I did, but his mom pointed out to me, I think he's mimicking your laugh, right? But Aww. but what we did was we slowly but surely, and this was through a process of me being very considerate of how he felt, slowly but surely, um, we started to kind of play together, but it took time. So at first it was the, the weird, you know, the weird uh, peekaboo game. And mm -hmm. then it grew to, he was playing with what he wanted to play with. I would grab something that was exactly like what he was playing with and mm -hmm. I would play with, and I would, and I would uh, turn my back and so our backs would be to each other and I would play with, and I'm like, oh, I see, you know, it's like, oh, I see why you like this, right? Mm -hmm. And then it started to get to a place to where he'd be playing with item he was playing with. I would sit next to him and he would take something that he was playing with and throw it in front of me, like here, you know, <laughs> like here, play with me, right? And I'm like, oh, thank you. And I'm, you know, playing with them and stuff. And then it kind of, it kind of kept growing and growing until then we could kind of face each other and we were actually playing until it eventually it moved into, I, he got to choose the game one time he came in, I got to choose the game next time and we started cooperative play. It was mm -hmm. a very interesting process, but it, and through that process, he developed like he always had the ability. Okay, so he developed language. He de he started to we we built is what I call building bridges. We built mm -hmm. the bridges to communication, verbal communication. We built the bridges too because see the capacity is there. Sometimes the access is not quite there. So I always mm -hmm. tell parents it's not because a lot of the parents, and depending on where they are on the spectrum, will be so upset with their children because they're like. They have such potential, or I know they can do this, or they can do this when they really want to, you know, I get all that kind of stuff. Right, right. But so the capacity is often there, mm -hmm. but there's just a space between them and it. Mm -hmm. So if we work, if we think of it like we're building bridges instead of thinking, you should already know how to do this, or you're smart enough to do this, or you're, you know, all those things that sometimes the parents will mistakes that people make. If we think of it as building bridges, then those things that, that people would say, you know, call common sense or whatever they want to call it, you just teach. And you right. teach and you keep building the bridges to those things. So, and then we built the bridges to empathy for him. So it wasn't that he didn't care about other people. It was that he lacked access to be able to show that. And right. so he had developed into a kid that his teacher, like six months later, after me, his teacher was like, losing her mind she's like oh my goodness one, one day i get this report oh my goodness a, a, a kid fell on the playground and mm -hmm. he ran over to him, he ran over to him and said are you okay and helped mm -hmm. him up right and she mm -hmm. was like what's going on right you know what's going on here right and um and so it was just really um i did a lot of learning through that process and i said told that whole story because i really wanted people to hear it I told that whole story to, to say this, that if you take an interest in what a kid, especially a kid who's on their own, who appears to be on their own agenda, which now you want to work on interpreting as perhaps the world is overstimulating to them. Perhaps mm -hmm. dealing with other people is overstimulating to them. And then, or perhaps, and this is one of the things that I've defined in the book, perhaps I need to work on the presence that I bring with this kid, and this is something that, this is one of my, this is step one of the LaFayette way, by the way, I'm getting, kind of segueing into that. Find your calm, because hypersensitive people, hypersensitive children, especially those on the autism spectrum, but, and I'm saying especially, and I guess I, I mean, I'm saying, I'm feeling like I shouldn't, because this happens for people with, you know, um, ADHD, reactive attachment, trauma, having mm -hmm. all kinds, but, but I want to say, especially for those who already kind of lack that social piece, okay, you, you will get very poor results if you are not operating from your peace space, right. okay? Because your peace space becomes their safe space. That was another big, huge thing I learned with Blue Tun Tunnel Boy. I learned that I had to come with my A game. If right. I was having an off day, it did not matter how well our session went last time it did not matter how professionally i tried to carry myself and talking all like none of that matter because he right. fell right into my internal experiences and he was having a pure fit if i was having a bad day mm -hmm. <laughs> and so so one of the first things i learned is okay let's say you have to figure you have to do something some affirmations some meditation 
you know, mm-hmm. find your zen because you can't work with this kid if you don't, right? And mm-hmm. so, and so, um, so yeah, it's uh, how do I get off on that? But anyway, <laughs> but yeah, um, with parents, I want to urge and encourage you to work towards or work or those working with people who are hypersensitive or or supporting people who are hypersensitive. I want you to work on understanding, especially when you're dealing with the spectrum, how important it is to take an interest in what, a a genuine interest in what they're interested in. And I mean genuine, because if you are faulty, if you're false, if you're fake in any way, they're going to read into it. And all of this false, fake, stuff that they're getting from people because they're concrete thinkers what they learn is you're not trustworthy you're right. a liar you right. feel you're you you clearly feel very upset or anxious or whatever it is on the inside and on the right. outside you're talking to me calmly which feels condescending right. now the reason i was able to immediately kind of connect the dots with that one is because that's very similar to how i've always been i've always just called myself really sensitive to people before, when I was younger, I just said, I hated people. All people were fake. They don't make sense. You know, this is what, you know, when I was younger, that's what I used to say. I didn't care. Um, but now I understand it to be that most of the time people are not congruent internally and externally. And it's mm-hmm. confusing and it's upsetting. And for those who are of high intelligence, they, they feel it's condescending. Like, you must think I'm stupid. Like, right. uh, you know, <laughs> you know you're really mad, but you're talking to me like this. Why are you doing that? You know? Mm-hmm. And, and where some people, they, they make the mistake of thinking, well, that's the way we're, suppo- we're supposed to try to present as calm so we don't further escalate. This is why you get the further escalation. I'm just so you know, you know, they're not responding to what you're saying. And I'm not saying go off on them either. They're not right. responding to what you're saying per se. They're, they're responding more to what's happening with you on the inside. So if you are very angry on the inside, the best thing you can do with a hypersensitive child person is to say, ooh, okay. I know I'm probably, the feel to me is probably really, really upset. I don't mean to bring that to you. It's mm-hmm. just that this thing right here was really, you know, it really threw me off. Okay, so so just try to, if you can, you know, try to try to forgive me or to, try not to tune in to, to how I feel on the inside. I'm just trying to work this through so that I don't feel as upset. Like you do much better doing that. So, right. um, but anyway, I know that was the longest winded answer to what you ever received in your life. So, <laughs> yeah, because you went into every other question. I was, I was like, okay, so you're kind of touching on my next question, which is how do you avoid or can you explain emotion soaking? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, the quick and dirty for emotion soaking is the unintentional sponging of Mm -hmm. other people's internal or emotional or feeling experiences Mm -hmm. now i know that many of you out there that that are hearing this you're like well that's just an impact okay but i want to make sure that i create the separation for you so that it's not confusing impact typically they can really put themselves in other people's shoes they put themselves in other people's bodies and other people's everything right um Mm -hmm. but that also usually typically comes along with a desire to fix the thing for the person, like overdoing, kind of being taken advantage of constantly, you know, all of that. Now, if you try to take the term empath and apply it to, say, someone on the spectrum who has zero interest in how happy you are and who are completely and totally not right. trying to not trying to put themselves in your shoes and understand right. what it is you're going through and, it, and it's displaying very little empathy. You know, right. then you're gonna get confused. But when I, that's why I had to kind of create the separation and get into that emotion soaking piece because empaths are emotion soakers. So they're on the other side of the, that, you know, that spectrum of emotion soaking. For those who are on the other side of it, they're absorbing all of this energy. And when there's lots of negative energy coming at them, or too much of a variety of energies coming at them, which is often why uh, people who are uh, people who are on the spectrum or have spectrum-like traits don't like to be in crowds. They don't like mm-hmm. to be around a lot of people. There's too much going on everywhere, you know? Right. And so there's just, if you can think of it as like this, it seems like there's just constant barrage of energy just like slamming into them over and over and over again. And then a bunch of things, expectations from others. Oh, I'm a disappointment because they want me to to love them and they say I don't act like I love them even though, you know, 
maybe my love doesn't look like their love, but you know, now I'm a disappointment. I'm, I'm frustrating, you know, so now all the self-esteem is going down at the same time. So you have this constant barrage of being hit with all of these emotions coming from other people. And so, but yeah, emotion soaking is basically the unintentional sponging and the inability to create that boundary between their own experiences and another person's experience. Mm -hmm. So then what can happen is if someone comes to them that's very upset, then they will take on and in multiples the upset of the other person. Okay. Right. And then it will feel like when you're dealing with higher intellect, it will feel like they're kind of going crazy because they didn't have anything per se that stimulated them in a way that could be as upsetting as they are. So mm -hmm. then it's just why do I get so upset? And then everyone else is giving them the same message. Why do you get so upset? You should just calm down. You know, right. you, you know, and all these things. Or you can calm down. You know, it, it's easy. Your sister can calm down. The other people your age can calm down. You know, and then they get all of the comparisons and all of that. So, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm speaking to some of that too and I'm getting to a different area. But, mm -hmm. but emotion soaking is basically that. High sensitivity to other people's kind of inner feelings. Mm-hmm. Okay, so going to another area of your book, um, it's kind of like trying to get your child to do what you want them to do, and everything you've tried is not working. So the parents have said, hey, I'm gonna take this away from you, I'm go to your room, have a time out, and all these things, but still what they're asking for is not being accomplished. So how is a, a way for parents to be able to get their child to do what they want them to do other than taking something away when a child doesn't really care if it's taken away? Oh my goodness. Okay, so this is one of my favorite subjects, by the way. Um, to moving from moving from punishment to consequences and knowing the difference. Because a lot of people don't know the difference. Okay. Um, especially again, when you're dealing with an emotion soaker. So if you're dealing with a child as if what they're doing is upsetting to you and you're coming to them angry, you're coming to them upset, you're coming to them with, you know, all this, you know, all this raw, you know, or whatever. Right. And, and I mean, feeling on the inside, not just the outside representation, you know, or both. Right. Okay. If you're coming to them with that, they're automatically going to have a bad reaction to you. Okay. So that's, that's first. That's understand that piece first. And that'll go a long way in helping you to understand how to gain better compliance. So right. step one, and so that that kind of takes me into the four steps of the LaFay way, because the four steps of the LaFay way is what helps you to gain compliance. Okay. Mm -hmm. So finding your calm is number one. If you are not finding your calm, if you not have, have not found your calm, then you need to study, practice, learn how to do this. And I, I'll think I give lots of suggestions. Self care is at the top. And, um, and it's really, really important to, to make sure that you're taking care of yourself because if not, you'll have very little ability, very little patience to, to deal appropriately or calmly with any bad stimulation or, you know, that you're getting. So find your calm as one. The second part is understand the real truth. Understand the real truth about yourself and about the person you're dealing with. Right now we're talking about kids, so a kid that doesn't want to do their chores. So understand the truth about yourself and that kid that doesn't want to do chores. Chores. What's the truth? The truth is, one, whatever your reactions are, they're your reactions. Right. They are not everybody else's reactions. They are yours based on your experiences in life, based on how you're triggered, based on, because some people I say, well, anybody will respond that way. And I will look at them in a second and be like, well, well, uh, yeah, I kind of don't, and I know other people who don't, you know, I kind of don't because I know it's not productive, and I know mm -hmm. other people who don't as well, so you can't put your reactions and how you, you know, how you respond to things on everybody is going to respond this way, that's a mistake, okay, so understand the real truth, however, whatever someone else is doing is impacting you, it belongs to you, okay, now the second truth, under, understanding the truth about the other, the child, whoever it is you're dealing with, Truth is, they don't like to do chores. I right. always try, and people tell me, oh my goodness, that's so, it makes so much sense. I don't know why I've never thought of that. They don't right. like to do chores. It's not that they don't appreciate you. It's not that they don't care about you. It's not that they don't care about anybody in the house, or they don't care that everybody else in the house has to do everything, and they don't have to do anything. It's none of that stuff. 
it is plain and simply they don't like to do chores. <laughs> okay. And then I'm gonna give I'm gonna give you guys a way to apply each of the concepts too. So so just bear with me. Okay. That's who understand the truth about yourself and them. And also understand the truth about yourself and them does what? It helps you to find your calm. Right. Okay. And so and then we get into a, a third step. The third step is to react according to your truest intentions. Okay, most of the time, as parents, because we're all parents right now, or as a loved one, as a family member, as a help, whatever, okay, we want to see people happy, and as parents, we want to see our kids feel safe, loved, cared for, right, confident mm -hmm. in themselves, right? right, so react according to your truest intentions. If you are judging your child harshly, if you are yelling, screaming, rolling your eyes, stomping about now, have your own tantrum, you know, then you are not reacting according to your truest intentions. Oh, I'm sorry, did I mention having peace in your house? Like everybody wants that, right? They want peace in their space, right? So right. that's another true intention. You're not reacting according to your truest intentions. What are you trying, what message are you trying to give to both yourself and the person you're dealing with? It's important to keep that peace in mind when you're dealing with them because then you can deal with them in a way that they can actually hear you. So if you're coming from a space of, I love you, I want you to feel safe, I want you to feel cared for, I want you to feel okay, I want you to have the things that you want to have, then all of a sudden you get the point. And then right. step four is my three R's, is recognize for one. So when you're following the first three steps, recognize and celebrate that for yourself. Like, yes, I'm doing it, I'm proud of myself because that, that also does what? It helps you keep your calm because now you have some measure of, you know, now you know, okay, I'm doing something right. I'm not, I'm not reacting against myself, showing things that I don't really mean to show. Like, now I'm mad at you because I'm mad at you, you know? <laughs> you, know so, you know, I want to love you, but I'm mad at you. You know, but uh, so, so recognize when change is starting to happen in them as well. Reinforce that. Highly, I'm very, very much into reinforcement for both self and others. Give yourself that pat on the back, and then give them that pat on the back, and repeat. So it's like you know, repeat and rinse, right? <laughs> we're trying to, we're trying to make sure that this is cycling through. And it's never that you're just looking at okay, one step, oh, one step at a time as you're going. You're flowing through the four steps the entire time. Okay, mm -hmm. so you're, it's, it's more of a flow than it is a one, two, three, four. You know. And, and I kind of prioritize it in the way that I did because find your calm really speaks to that emotion soaking piece that you have to eliminate that barrier before you can have make breakthrough in any other way. So now I'm gonna break it down in, as far as how you respond and how it applies and get, how, you, how to get that compliance mm -hmm. to applying those failures. So first you find your calm, right? That's That one's simple enough. We're not simple, but you know, explanation simple enough, <laughs> right? First thing, but then when you're dealing with a kid that doesn't like to clean their room and they're like losing, you know, they're going to lose privileges and stuff like that, okay? Then understanding the real truth just means, okay, I'm feeling really upset because they didn't do their chores because for me, now I'm feeling like I just got off work. I've been watching, you know, and then I have to come home and watch kids cook dinner. I'm doing my part. And ain't nobody else over here doing their part. You know, you know, there we go. Exactly. Know, exactly. Right? But, but for you, your part has more to do with, like I said, your experiences, your personality, your temperament. So first of all, put yourself in check before you go to all that judgment space, all that irritation space. Check mm -hmm. yourself. So understand the real truth. And, and if you really want to break it down, you can say to yourself, well, oh, shoot. I don't really like doing chores either. Well, I kind of don't blame you, right? You know, and when you come with that kind of attitude, just that one alone can capture your kids' compliance because you can, when you come to them, you can say, baby, I know you really hate doing this. You know, I know you really hate doing the dishes. You know, whatever, it feels gross on your hands. You know, some kids have sensory issues. Some other real stuff going on why they don't want to do things, right? I know that you really hate doing the dishes. But, you know, we all kind of hate doing chores, you know, but we all have to do our part. And I taught you and I'm not going to teach you any differently. Work before play, you know. So, so I mean, I, I love you. I love you so much. But 
what I'm not going to do, and no, and because I love you, I'm not going to teach you that you play before you work, because then you'll go out in the world and you will be highly unsuccessful. Right. So what I need from you is for you to make sure you get those dishes before I'm able to, you know, to let you play this video game or before I'm able to let you go to your friend's house or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So then it's not, and like I said, when I say small adjustments, I mean small adjustments. So what are parents doing? They're saying, they're saying, you're not going to be able to go to your friend's house until you clean your room, you know? Mm -hmm. So what are the, these, these kids, first of all, sometimes with processing issues too. So now we have language processing. You're adding anxiety on top of language processing issues. So what are they hearing you say? You can't go. You can't have. You can't do. So what does that mean? We're at war now. Oh, so you're mm -hmm. telling me I can't have what I want to have, right? So then you fight and you wonder why you're fighting with this kid now, <laughs> right? It's going to get so compliant. As opposed to having them hear your truth, which is, baby, I really want you to have the things that you want to have. Because a lot of times parents are upset because they have to take things away from their kids. They're like, man, now I'm taking away their video game. Now I have to deal with them. Now they're not, you know, <laughs> now they're right. not having their distraction down there in my face, you know? Right. right. <laughs> so, you know, so they're just as upset about their freedom being taken too. Like, I'm being punished, but my kids are being punished, right? right. Which is which is why a lot of the parents actually release their kids from their their punishments, which I don't recommend, release the kids from their punishments earlier because they're being punished too. <laughs> you know? So anyway, but you want the kids to hear I want you to have this thing too. So again, we're now we're entering into truest intentions too. See how it all kind of blends and mixes and works together. My truest intention is for you to be a happy kid and for me to be happy with you because I love you. I want you to feel okay. I want you to be okay. I want you to be able to think, do the things that make sense, you know, that you want to do and all of that. I don't want you to feel like I'm taking things away all the time or, and I definitely don't want to be a bad guy, you know? And so then, you know, truest intentions now you're coming to them in a whole different kind of way. Like, okay, it's like again, yeah, maybe I don't I don't blame you for feeling the way you feel, but this is what this is what needs to happen before you can get to this. So, you know, don't 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 mess yourself up. You know, we both want you to be happy, right? Truest intention. We both want you to be happy. Right. And then what happens when you talk this way, when you come up with this, you know, brand new way of addressing things, not just externally. I love to teach the words. But you guys, I have to go back to find your calm because I have to over, over emphasize that you have to be internally okay. Internally feeling this love for this real love that you truly feel towards your child and not have that all be clouded and blocked by those things like anger and all that. And then mm -hmm. think that that's okay. Well, I get angry because I love them and I want what's best for them. It's like, come on, guys. Come on. You know, what does anger really look like? Though? Does it look like love, healthy love, for real? Right? Mm -hmm. So so then, you know, and I'm not saying, I'm, I'm, and I just want everybody, my background is I had the biggest temper ever, you know, when I was younger. So I'm not coming from a place of I've always been calm and saying, and nope, that's none of me. All of the <laughs> hyperness you see in me is some real true hyperness, and it came along with a real, real bad temper. So mm -hmm. I learned all of this stuff kind of a hard way and I finally decided one day I'd rather be happy. I, I love that there's a quote fuck out there, I'd rather be happy than right. Oh mm -hmm. my goodness, I think it's in the DBTs or whatever. Oh, that is the most beautiful thing ever. I would much rather be happy than right. Let me be wrong every day and be happy. Okay. Right. <laughs> and so, right. <laughs> but then you know after you go through those first three steps, then the last step is really about staying steady with it. And you stay steady with it by recognizing when it's happening, because that keeps you encouraged, which keeps you calm, which mm -hmm. keeps you, you know, in a problem solving space, you know, and all that. And then reinforcing does the same thing. It keeps you calm, keeps them calm. It helps them to do the thing that you want them to do more. Because now mm -hmm. you're reinforcing that compliant behavior and repeat. Mm -hmm. okay? And mm -hmm. so, you know, so it's just really, um, that is, it's, that's how you start to gain compliance in any relationship but it's especially necessary when you're dealing with a hypersensitive individual because they already have enough things stacked against them not mm -hmm. to have to pile on top of that all of your negative feelings your judgment your 
your disappointment and frustration and you know all of that stuff okay so we want to try to to clear as much space for them to be true to themselves as well because we all as human beings desire connection i know everybody said ask somebody out there that you say well i don't know so and so don't seem like they want to be you know everybody says that kind of stuff but truth be told everybody desires connection and when the connection is not there there is true and utter unhappiness okay and so and i would say you know and i would say okay maybe not all of the time but i would say most of the time it's our human nature you know some of the old studies that that you know told the stories of the babies in the orphanages who would actually have people come and occasionally pick them up those babies lived and the babies who maybe they may have been fed and all of that but if they were never picked up and handled and you know in some kind of way they would just turn or, or turn the other way and die and mm -hmm. that's how much our us as human beings we need to connect to one another mm -hmm. So, okay, you you gave me a lot of information there. And like I said, you always piggyback and go into something that <laughs> that I was going to speak of next. And so you kind of already answered the question about how do I not personalize my child's behavior towards me, you know? Oh, how do okay. I yeah. Well, actually, you know what, that's a, that I love the question because, you know, I, I do, I over-elaborate on them. Um, I over-elaborate, but that's actually a good question to ask separately because there are ways not to personalize okay mm -hmm. so and some of it gets into understanding the real truth helps you not to personalize so understanding that a kid not wanting to wash the dishes is just a kid that doesn't want to wash the dishes helps you not to personalize right. <laughs> you know um um what else helps you not to personalize is and what I talked to before too, what I spoke to before, that self-care. Oftentimes, if you check yourself, okay, when you're feeling like other people are being inconsiderate towards you, especially when you're kind of, you have a bit of that, you know, martyr syndrome going on where it's like, oh, I'm so exhausted. I have to do everything all day, all the time, right? And you have that thing going on for yourself, you're feeling so sorry for yourself, mm -hmm. then you have to understand that there's something in there that's problematic with the treat how you treat yourself okay because you're unable to set a boundary which which says i'm important enough to take a break i'm important enough to say no this time i'm important enough to say okay maybe not a no because i, I do discuss no's in the book as well but i'm important enough to say to this child who wants this thing right now hey, I'm not going to be able to do that right this second, but I could do it for you here, you know, tomorrow, whatever. I could do it for you here, but, you know, you have to show me that you're going to be okay with that or, you know, that option's off the table, right? Because, you know, something, you know, the, you know, so, and it's really not just a kind of keep pushing and pushing and pushing and overdoing, especially overdoing for a kid that has been acting like a real asshole, Okay, when you get overdoing <laughs> or you know, when you when you're overdoing for somebody and they are just mistreating you, mistreating you, mistreating you, what are you teaching them? You're teaching them you're reinforcing your own mistreatment once. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're also teaching them that that they don't really have to behave in a in a way that should be deserving of what it is they're getting. Mm -hmm. okay? You're not teaching, you're teaching them to feel like it's their right to get whatever it is they want, as opposed to the privilege of someone who knows how to act. Mm -hmm. okay? And so it's not, I, I, would, I try to work with parents on that, have such a hard time with telling their kids no or not right now. And my, I, one of my favorite things to teach them is, okay, you know, I really, I would, like my strength hurts me even, not to be able to give this to you because you know, a lot of parents, Again, digging into understanding the real truth, a lot of parents who come from a history where they didn't feel like they got much, they will overdo for their kids all day long. Like, I just want my kids to have everything, right? And then they'll feel horribly stripped when they do have to tell their kids no because their kids are acting out. So then there's extra emotion added to not being able to give to their kids. So now they're upset because they can't give to their kids. So now right. they're <laughs> acting just like their parents did and they're denying their kids things which breaks their own heart right which breaks the parents heart right and yep. so 
<laughs> but but moving right so but moving into that space just moving into that space where you truly truly get why you're doing what you're doing like i have to tell this kid that i can't do this right now because i love him too much to teach him to make me dislike him okay because mm -hmm. the worst thing for a kid is for their own parents not to like them if your own parent doesn't like you what is the possibility that many others are going to like you? And then right. people wonder why their kids are out there acting fools out there in public, right? Mm -hmm. When they when they receive the message that they're not liked, why would they pretend as if they're like a bull? Why would they right. pretend as if that's a possibility with anyone else? There's no point, right? But but yet coming to that place where you truly kind of start to to get it, where you start to say, okay, I won't be able to do this for this reason, because this will teach them the wrong, this will give them the wrong message. And then you start teaching them from that way. That'll move you to out of punishment and into consequences. Baby, I, 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 I can't, like I literally kind of tied my hands on this one. Like for kids who act out at school, you know, if you, if your teacher does something wrong and you go off on that teacher, then you have effectively tied my hands now. Now I'm not gonna go in there looking stupid because right. you already you already took care of it in your way. I wouldn't say it was effective, but right. you already took care of it. So then what am I to do behind that? So then you teach your kids, hey, if you're able to maintain your calm while you're there in that space, I know it's upsetting when your teacher's doing something wrong and you come home and you let me know, I promise you I'll have your back. I'm all over, it, right? You know, so then, you know, so, and I'm getting like, I'm getting into other areas again. <laughs> but, um, but as far as not personalizing, you're right. I did answer the question within the four steps, but I'm glad that you asked the question so that we can make the connections within the four steps. Mm -hmm. Because another, even getting to that fourth step, another piece to not personalizing, I'm sorry, no longer get back up that third step. Another piece to not personalizing is being true to yourself. So when you're truly behaving in the way that you would choose to behave, like you, none of us wake up in the morning thinking, yes, I'm going to be so upset with my kid and frustrated and yelling by the end of this day. I can't wait. Like <laughs> nobody's waking up in the morning thinking that ever. Okay. <laughs> and so, you know, some people might wake up. I hope some people are waking up thinking, you know, I'm going to have a great day. I'm, you know, I'm going to show lots of love. I'm going to have lots of peace mm -hmm. throughout me. You set your intention for the day. I hope mm -hmm. if you're not doing that, I want you to work on that. But mm -hmm. let's say your intention for the day. But if we unsaid intentions of the day, okay, if we talk about those and you're true to those, then you're going to feel better about your experiences with others. So you'll less personalize. You won't have to blame them for your acting out. If you would just wash the dishes like I told you to, <laughs> I wouldn't have to go off like this, you know. <laughs> And now I feel bad about myself because I've been yelling when I said I wasn't going to yell anymore, you know. <laughs> all I'm all stressed out. You stressed out. Everybody's stressed out. <laughs> right. It's because of you. No, that's because of you. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then, so you, then you put yourself in that double bad space of now you're, you're seriously working against yourself in every way. You're working against yourself with yourself because you don't want to be the yeller. You're working against yourself when it comes to your child because now your child's not feeling loved, protected, cared for, blah, right? Right. Mm -hmm. so, so it's much easier not to personalize when you're true to yourself. And and again with step four, same. It's much easier not to personalize things when you're recognizing positive change in self mm -hmm. and you're seeing your own growth. And even if the kid's still acting up with some, you know, and you're not acting up with them. You know, recognizing that and saying, oh, I'm so glad I'm not contributing to this. You know, <laughs> like, oh, baby, you are having a hard time. I'm not coming with you. You know, you, <laughs> you let me know when you're feeling a little better, okay? Because, you know, right now you're setting yourself up for some, you know, to, have, to end up not having the stuff that you like to have, which we both don't okay. you know, kind of, you know, you know, so, but recognizing, reinforcing, and repeating the steps, of course, that's also going to keep you in a space where you personalize less because now it feels like we have some measure of control. Mm -hmm. okay. So that was actually really great. That was a lot. Um, a lot I appreciate of you 
<laughs> love working with you. I learned so much. I can apply it to my life mm-hmm. and the stuff that I am work in life, though. But so I love working with you. I love getting this information. I love being able to implement it and see how it works. Yeah. And so there's like a ringing noise in the background. Is that my computer or is, you know, is, is it it's probably your computer? I don't hear any ringing. Oh, well, well, I guess we, uh, this has been a good recording. I'm sure this information is going to come out again. I hope it doesn't drive everybody nuts. Maybe I might be the, hopefully I'm the only one that can hear it. It's not messing it up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you hear, can you hear that ringing noise or is it just me? You don't hear it? Oh, well then I'm excited that you don't hear. It. Okay. So anyway, um, I feel like this went most excellent. Um, I'm going to, I've always try to be considerate of your time and everybody else's time. And I've designated one hour for this and we're at, at, you know, 56 after the hour. Um, (laughs) Your questions were fantastic. Um, Any last like clarification questions or something that you know somebody out there might be wondering um, based on what it is that I said, you know, that I can maybe clarify a little bit more. Only that a lot of the skills that we think we don't have and possess, that we have them and that we just need to implement them. That's a lot, it. Mm-hmm. A, lot of, a lot of people, clients come to counseling and they have think they have all these problems and they can't get through them. They're so overwhelmed and their kid is doing this. And you listen and the more you listen, you hear, hey, they have some of these tools. We just need to make them be aware of them to help them to reach the goal that they want to reach. Yes, yes. I have so many people that I work with and I love to tell them, you know, because they come into therapy all, you know, distraught and feeling like, and they feel like, man, we should be able to figure this out. We shouldn't have to come in here and talk to somebody, you know, to figure this out. But, the, you know, the honest truth is life is, is, is very, it's diff, very difficult to kind of maneuver through these things that happen in our lives. Mm-hmm. And, 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 to, and to be perfectly honest, what I'm saying, what I've been talking about today is really not out there. You know, there are a lot of concepts out there, but they're kind of missing little things here and there that kind of really help you to tie it together. My whole thing has always been that you're not ever missing it. When you love another person, you're not missing it by a mile, unless you're abusive or something like that. Then you're right. missing it by a mile. You need to go get some counseling, right. figure it out. You know, exactly. do something better than what, what you're doing. And don't try to just find, make, make yourself right either because you're not you know, so, but, sorry, did anybody notice that I got on my soapbox, but whatever, um, but <laughs> I want to say that the bottom line of it is most people aren't missing it by a mile. It is these small adjustments. The, it, the fact that they're small adjustments is what kept me from sharing this information for so long on a larger scale. Like, I literally had to have some things happen in my life where it was just like, okay, but fair, you're going to share this gift or you're going to suffer. <laughs> you know, I've literally had that happen and it's, you know, kind of pinned down because I'm already. And, um, and I don't like being in front of cameras and people and stuff. So, you know, but, uh, you know, <laughs> and I've seen so many, like, uh, so many families that are like, but you have to share this with people. Like, we've been in counseling for so many years and we've never mm-hmm. heard this or we've never heard it like this before. You know, there's so many more people, so many kids. I think mm-hmm. what really what really got me was when somebody told me there's so many kids out there suffering for so long and they don't have to. So so that's why it is that I'm doing what I'm doing now. Um, I appreciate you so much, Tinky. Um, I appreciate everybody who joined us. I'm sorry if you had questions because I'm doing this via Zoom. I don't really know how to, you know, gain access to the questions and stuff. So, but starting next week, I'll offer the option for people to email questions to me or I'll try to figure it out. Like, I'm not the most tech savvy person in the world. Like, I know this stuff. Technology is not my favorite. So, uh, but I'll work on my end so that, and, but then, or also you can join us via Zoom. So you will be a part of this conversation. So we'll have you here with us and then you can type them in a the chat and I'll see your questions all day long. Or I'll stop and ask for, you know, for questions as we're moving along too, because they won't always be set up in this way. Sometimes we'll have it set up where I have a specific person from, you know, interns, schools, parents, you know, all that, because I want to, you know, a variety. Hopefully I can get some, some uh, peace officers in here because I want them to ask any questions um, because I want to work on that community relations stuff, you know, but going to have that 
Um, but other times I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna have it open and we're gonna play it by ear. Whatever it is that people ask me for, I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna, we're gonna try my best to give it. But I look forward to seeing you all in the future and future sessions. I love this, this was great. And my favorite, you guys will learn if you check me out on my YouTube channel at LaFailway, my favorite thing to tell you at the end is stay you and stay true.